and uh, I'm very happy to say that the uh, cohort 10 is a will be a uh, female only cohort, our first uh, female only cohort. Um, so much more information about the uh, what we're what we're trying to do there after the panel uh, discussion. Um, before we start, I'd like to hand over to uh, Stephen Gugu, my my partner in crime, one of my partners in crime. Give us a bit of an update on uh, the Academy uh, before we start with the actual panel conversation. Stephen, over to you. Uh, thanks, David, and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, really excited to have uh, uh, you join us for today. Uh, just in case uh, you're new to the Academy, uh, just wanted to share a couple of uh, statistics uh, in terms of what we've been up to in the last uh, four years. Um, so, you know, the Africa Angel Academy has been training angel uh, investors across the continent uh, for the last four years, since 2020. Uh, and the whole mission about the Angel Academy is to, first of all, equip uh, angels with uh, information or knowledge about uh, investing in the early stage uh, companies. Uh, and also to, you know, bring in experienced angel investors from the continent to just come and share the experiences uh, about what works in the continent. Um, and the, the key thing is, of course, to make sure that we get more investment into the startups uh, who are solving uh, critical problems across the continent. And uh, just in terms of what we've been able to achieve so far, uh, so far over 600 angel investors uh, have been trained. Um, and these are from uh, 21 countries uh, and counting. Uh, 17 angel groups have been created so far and we've done nine cohorts. Uh, David spoke about the cohort that's just uh, oncoming. Uh, that's the 10th cohort. Uh, one thing we're really proud about is that uh, all our Cohort, uh, I mean, so far we had 48% uh, women participation, uh, which is really good. And we're hoping that's going to start translating uh, into the uh, uh, early stage investing ecosystem, especially on the angel side, where we'll see more angel investors making investments and more uh, female uh, uh, founders getting uh, funding uh, for their startups. Uh, John, if we jump to the next slide. And uh, the implementing partners uh, for the Africa Angel Academy, uh, there is Viridian. Uh, you'll get to hear from Alex uh, towards the end of this. Uh, Prina is uh, out of uh, Cape Town in South Africa uh, and delivers early stage entrepreneur and investor programs uh, across uh, the continent. Uh, and there's uh, Victoria Ventures uh, out of Kenya. We run an angel network called the Victoria Business Angels Network. Uh, but on top of that, uh, also do other programs focused on uh, early stage investment. Uh, I'm, uh, one of, I'm the founder of the Victoria Business Angels Network and uh, you know, really excited to you know, share some of the experiences that we've learned uh, with uh, angels from across the continent. Um, and uh, of course, uh, with uh, lots of other partners, these are the key implementing partners. Uh, but uh, you know, you we have so many people who uh, come on board, experienced angel investors, investors from the continent who've come on board to share their experiences and to just make sure that we are building the next crop of angel investors. And uh, right. And, and uh, just in case you're not aware, if you go to the website of uh, Africa Angel Academy. Uh, you can see the link down there. There's lots of technical content that we've created that's really useful for someone who's starting their journey. Uh, if you're an angel group, uh, if you're just interested in terms of just learning more about uh, angel investing in the different countries that I've mentioned that we've done some uh, training in. Uh, so these are case studies which have just been launched uh, about different angel groups, uh, which gives you a sense of how to create an angel uh, uh, group, the kind of challenges uh, you saw, like uh, expect how you can be able to resolve some of those. Uh, and so I would really advocate for you to go and check them out. Uh, on top of that, we have some legal guides that we've created that just speak about how to invest in different ecosystems. Uh, if I'm not wrong, I don't know how many countries we own right now, but uh, uh, we have uh, Ghana, uh, Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, uh, and more sort of like uh, loading in this case. So if you're interested to learn much more about the tax, uh, legal, jurisdiction, governance issues that you need to be considering when you're investing in those ecosystems, uh, please jump on uh, to uh, the link that was shared earlier. I think we'll just paste it in. And you can then be able to pick out uh, some of those legal guides. Uh, very proud of the partners who've been behind this, uh, Bowman's uh, TLP Advisory, uh, Domicy Attorneys, and so uh, and, and several others that we've worked with. Uh, but really good information that we also share uh, from uh, the academy. David, I'm going to pass this back to you, uh, so that we can uh, uh, jump start the show. Oh, sorry, do you want to go through this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, we do lots of uh, regional events. Uh, and uh, these are just some of the events which have happened uh, between 23 and uh, 2024. Uh, some uh, really interesting uh, meetups where you get to interact with other uh, angel investors. I think one that's missing from here is that we had an event out of Nairobi that just happened last week, where we hosted the alumni of AAA together with other early stage investors. 
So please make sure to follow us on our socials uh, to join. If you're an alumni member, uh, please make sure that you join the WhatsApp groups. There's lots of information that we share there about uh, local meetups. Uh, and the whole idea is just to keep the community uh, active and to keep learning together and to keep uh, making investments. Very good. Uh, very good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Um... Yeah, what I'd like to do, uh, John, is just to maybe just first to sort of introduce the, the the panel speakers, and then we'll go back to uh, to Menti. There we go. So, um, yeah. So today we want to speak about secondaries um, uh, in the context of early stage investing in Africa, and we have invited three speakers, the experts that we thought could really uh, help uh, sort of make this conversation come to life. Um, so very happy to be joined today by Hannah, Eric, and Abraham. Um, um, do you? Is it probably easiest for you to just briefly introduce yourselves? Um, Hannah, if I can invite you to uh, to start, maybe. Right. Um, hi. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much for your time and the invitation. My name is Hannah Speikamwanga. I have been sitting on the board of EBAN, one of the largest African business angels association. And I've also co-founded two uh, prominent uh, investment clubs in Africa, Dazzle Angels in South Africa and DRC Impact Angels in DRC. Uh, so looking forward to discuss about angel investment trends on the continent and angel buyers to create in spot for you. Very good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hannah. Calling in from uh, sunny uh, Dakar, Senegal. Uh, the line was breaking up a little bit in the beginning, but it sounds like at the end everything was fine. So let's see how it goes. Um, Eric, thanks for joining us. Maybe a few words about your background. So um, thank you for having me, David. Uh, so my name is Eric Hong. Um, I've been uh, for the last uh, nine years CEO and co-founder of uh, Green Tech Capital. Uh, we have invested in uh, 44 companies across Africa. Uh, we had uh, six partial exit and one full exit. Um, and I'm very happy to be able to contribute there. Today, uh, I'm uh, representing a Zytec Investment Office which is a asset management company focusing on supporting uh, portfolio management and exit management for uh, investors that have uh, exposure to Africa. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, merci beaucoup. And then last, but definitely not least, uh, Abraham who's calling in from, uh, from Kigali. Abraham, a few, a few words about yourself and about your background. Yeah, uh, thank you, David. A uh, few quick words, I'm Abraham Augustine. Um, used to be a journalist in my past life, still am, kind of, um, and also a researcher covering digital economies. As a journalist, covered private equity and venture capital a bit, fair bit, um, and now I work with Norskin as a programs and comms manager out of Kigali. Very good. Thanks a lot. So just maybe to add a few words from my side about why we thought it was sort of... Um, good uh, to bring you into the conversation. So um, I've known uh, Eric for, for a very long time. Um, as he mentioned, he's a long-term investor. I also consider him one of the sort of original architects of the ecosystem. Um, and uh, Eric and I speak once in a while. And I know that over the past period, he's been doing a lot of work specifically around exits and specifically around secondaries. So um, Eric sort of as... Uh, has been sort of exploring the ecosystem, trying to identify the pain points. And um, and one of them is definitely on the, the side of the exits and creating liquidity. Um, so I thought that we thought that it was, it's, if, if anyone would join this position, it should be Eric. Um, very much looking forward to hear sort of your you know, analysis of the pain points and challenges and also you know, possible solutions, how to address this. Um, Hanna, of course, um, has been a, a long-time investor. The the angel uh, networks that you mentioned, but also uh, you've worked in in private equity with South Suez. You've worked with Proparco, um, um, and of course, Aban, Dazzle, DRC, uh, Impact Angels. 
And now, of course, uh, you know, you're probably best known for the work you do or the, as being a partner for, uh, for Launch uh, with Launch Africa uh, and Launch Africa obviously being um, one of the most, if need the most or the most active uh, uh, VC investor, um, I guess, looking at the number of deals. Um, and I'm always very excited about the fact that, you know, the number of deals that Launch Africa is able to do I'm always also a little bit concerned at the same time about then the number of exits you, you know, you need to do also to return at capital. So I know that, um, you know, exits, uh, you know, liquidity, returning capital, so high on the agenda of, um, yeah, of future Africa. Um, so also for that reason, very, you know, we thought it was super interesting to have you as part of the conversation. Um, and then Abraham, of course, as a, as a journalist, as a, as a researcher, um, hey, you have been um, uh, asking uh, the tough questions for a number of years and still are, but definitely over the past years, uh, really sort of, you know, digging into the ecosystem, uh, what works, what doesn't work. Um, and you've also yourself, you've written about exits. I was rereading one of your articles from November 22 uh, when you spoke about exits and then Techaball has um, uh, the, 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 the platform that you've also been associated with came out with an article specifically about secondaries in January of this year. So I think it's, you know, very topical to talk about this, uh, this topic. Um, and, you know, on behalf of, of our team, uh, thanks again for making your time available to, uh, to speak with everyone. Um, so, and then a shout out to the audience. This is always, it's always very informal conversation. So everyone should feel very much invited to, you know, ask questions, add comments, uh, raise your hand if you want to make a point, share your own experiences, you know, drop a note in the chat, uh, and drop a question in the chat, uh, our team will find it. But, you know, this is, these are informal conversations. Uh, so anything you'd like to add, please, you're very, very welcome to do so. Okay, now uh, we thought we wanted to start the panel conversation uh, in a simple way. We have a couple of questions via Mentimeter. Um, if you can take us back to the Mentimeter questions, John. So for those of you, I think the first question is further back. Uh, yeah, so let's start about, you know, how many, let's, you know, we want to sort of test the, level of knowledge of the audience. So most of you have read the reports, read the news, you're, you're, you know, you read the social media. How many startups raised at least 100K uh, in Africa in 2023? Um, if you're not, yeah, can we get the QR code again for the Mentimeter? And for those of you who are not familiar with Menti, you know, just scan the code with your phone. It will take you directly to the same question, you'll be able to answer the question on your phone, or uh, if you go to Mentimeter, go to the website, uh, then um, uh, you can also find the same question. Um, and uh, so I see some questions, some answers coming in. Um, yeah, so this is very much, this is the nef definition of the number of companies that raise capital and that's recorded at least 100,000 US. Any more answers coming in? Anyone else? Is it 10? Is it 150? Is it how many deals were done last year? I see some more answers coming in, more answers coming in. Slowly but surely. More answers coming in slowly but surely. We'll give it another minute or so. Okay, so it's a very mixed, uh, big bag right now. Um, so the right answer, as recorded by friends from Africa, the big deal is. 500 companies. Um, Brider puts the number of companies that raised capital last year slightly higher to about a thousand. I think Partex somewhere in between. But uh, so about 500 companies have raised capital. So the next question then is, 
how many exits have been recorded in that same year in 2023 to how many exits have been recorded and this data comes from brighter is it five is it 30 is it 200 is it 800 how many exits have been done anyone how many exits okay here the answers are definitely on the lower side so we have five we have 30 we have 200 but the correct answer here is 30. So this is recorded with Brighter Bridges. So, so we said about 500 companies or 600 or 700, but in that range have raised capital. And we have 30 companies that exited last year. And these, of course, are, you know, as far as we know, right, public announced, uh, public announced exits. Um, and then so, yeah, so technically, if you, I think Partech reports that over the last 10 years, about 20 billion has been invested in total. Um, and uh, so then the question, the question is how much of the capital has been returned already to investors and at what, what X, if you will. Okay. Now we could not, not, um, add this question, um, today being international women's day. Is that correct? Is that today international women's day? I want to see some, there we go. So how much capital was raised by women led ventures in 2023? Slightly not, not very clear to exit, but simply how much of the capital was raised but the numbers being reported is about 3 billion, 4 billion. Uh, Brighter puts it at 3.9. Uh, Africa, the big deal at 2.9. I think Partech at 3.5 billion. So how much of that was raised by female investors? And this one day is tomorrow, March 8th, of course. So in light leading up to International Women's Day, we want to include this question. And the correct answer here is not enough. Want... It's not that enough. Is, Never enough. That's the correct answer. It's not enough. Well, no matter what, it's not Thank enough. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander Fraser. Uh, the correct answer is 201. Well, the, the, the answer has been the in, <laughs> it's 201 million. So obviously a very small percentage of total, uh, which hopefully we will uh, help addressing by making our next, our upcoming cohort uh, female only. Um, but we'll get to that at a later time. Okay, this was just sort of to, uh, to sort of to, uh, to help set the scene for the actual panel conversations. Now we'll, now we'll bring in the experts, Hannah and Eric and um, uh, Abraham. So uh, maybe I wanna start with you, Eric. So I, I introduced you a little bit as someone who has spent time Sort of analyzing the ecosystem, try to identify pain points, and also thinking about exits and secondaries. Can you maybe sort of, yeah, sort of take us with with us on your journey in terms of, you know, why do you, what what do you do right now specifically on secondaries, and 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 you know why is that? Why did you why do you think this is important to spend your time on? Um, well, um, thank you, David, for the questions. So. Um, what I do now is I run Zytec Investment Office, who specializes in uh, portfolio management and uh, exit management. And uh, the reason I move uh, from green tech to uh, Zytec is uh, because the same way I I saw the challenge of the capital um, like ten years ago in the ecosystem, I think that there is another challenge uh, because the capital needs to move. And when we look at um, when we look at how the evolution and the traction of the ecosystem happen and the role that the angel ecosystem has played in that, so they, they, they contribute and they, they, they financing the first innovation. If that ecosystem doesn't get back the money and start to see that it's actually not as profitable as it can be, that will have a, an impact on the cycle of innovation. So I think that it's very critical that uh, this aspect is addressed and and that's why I've decided to put my energy and focus on on uh, on these areas, um, and uh, very simply because all the startups that you see today and even those that are Series A, Series B, at some point they've been like very early entrepreneur and they went to see a, an angel investors. Angel investing being very new, it's also mean that those are people that move on the non comfort zone. You know they. People with wealthy people in Africa usually go to infrastructures, you know, business that they really know. And so some people, they took the risk 
and with a certain perception in terms of how they're going to make money in the future, looking at the U.S. model, looking at all the, all the other venture capital, uh, um, venture capital market. And, and, that's, and I think that um, there's a necessity to clarify what is uh, the opportunity of exit, when to exit, and also to clarify what is the venture capital model that should be adapted to Africa versus the U.S. market, which has a different economic model, which is floated with money. And, um, and I think that that's very important. So that's why I, I went to that, um, that space and I started to dig in a little bit. Okay, very good. Thank you. So maybe just um, to start with the definition, right? Definition, sorry. So when we talk about secondary transactions, so these are, uh, we refer to when either employees or investors in a company sell their existing, existing shares to another investor, right? So obviously it's from one investor to another investor. And it appears to me, it always appears that there's somewhat, it's somewhat mysterious in terms of how do, do, how do these deals get done? At what price? Is there a discount? It's very much not transparent, uh, not visible, um, and maybe also not very scalable. Um, have you any thoughts from, your, from, from you on that respect? Um, well, I, I, first of all, I think that there is also uh, the first priority is a matter of transparency. And uh, the transparency uh, being a culture, it has to be implemented at the level of the, the founders and at the level of the investors. Because, as you said, when you have an investment round, uh, usually what you see in the ecosystem is that you have a lead investors. And unfortunately, often the lead investors make the work and then you have other investors who somehow piggyback on the, the work that is done and they follow up in the investing. And, and what it has created is that created a dynamic the last years where you have people who are invested and then it was running behind. Uh, now, when you go into the secondaries, uh, you will have a control of the information, but usually the effort that is implemented because it's not, uh, it's not a market where you have a lot of big investors that goes in the secondaries because the the um, they, some of them they don't have the mandate, and most importantly, due to our new ecosystems, the governance is often chaotic. You have SPV of angel investors on SPV who invest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's very chaotic. So usually, large investor will like to go in a round that is very clean, very very transparent, and that and that need of transparency and information is critical for people to be able to have an evaluation of not only the performance of the company at that moment, but the capability of the, of the company to take strategic decisions and the influence the investors who's coming in will have within to that constellation. And that, um, and unfortunately in our environment, there's a lot of element that make that transparency very complicated. Um, so I think that that's the first point uh, to, address to understand that people that will be buying will probably be buying if they know where they're going. And when we look at the different stakeholders uh, and we're considering that we, when the first investor are angel investors, so which means that the company is grows and then it will be later investors. So either that will be VCs that will be in series A's or in series B. And for those one, for those one, they have a certain standard in terms of quality of information. And the gap between the understanding of the quality of information, the understanding of governance from the angel investors and the later investors, that will, from my point of view, for the moment, will probably more come from um, international investors, is this gap that we need to close. And that is the, okay. that is the challenge. Okay. Thank you. So, so maybe, so, so also, so, so to bring Hannah into the conversation, so... Anna, you 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 worked in you work both in private equity where secondaries are more commonplace. You work in VC, right. you work in angel. So, how would you kind of describe the current? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so it's a very interesting point. And and before focusing on the two bridges that you have mentioned, the bridge between angel investors and VC investors, 
and then the bridge between VC investors and private equity investors. Uh, first of all, in Africa, there is definitely a change in mindset that is required, uh, both in, uh, on the side of the founders, uh, the institutional investors, the angel investors. Uh, there is always a negative sort of perception of secondary transactions. And uh, again, at times you hear founders saying, oh, but why do you want to sell shares in my business? Then it will send, a, it will send a, a bad signal to the market that you're no longer interested in my ventures. Uh, so no, uh, at the end of the day, when it comes to investment, whether it's PVC or angel investment, so this is investor, enter business, add value, and then exit. So it's part of the full value creation uh, system. And I was uh, quite uh, taken aback by one uh, VC fund that had met uh, from Dubai, uh, like in Nairobi, and was like, yeah, of course, in Dubai, everybody knows that every two or three years, you know, we are um, uh, exiting some of our portfolio companies and we create liquidity and everybody is fine with that. Um, so the change in mindset is really important. Uh, second thing, um, I think the hurdles and the, the issues that you find between angel investment and VC investment and then VC investment and P investments are quite, some are similar, but most are quite different. I think typically what prevents uh, good secondary deals to happen uh, from angel investors to these investors is exactly what Eric was referring to. Angel investors typically are not uh, equipped to prepare uh, the, the startup to receive institutional on investment, uh, both in terms of, mainly in terms of documentation, I would say, right? They don't assist a startup building, just giving a random example, but building a financial model, preparing a proper data room, uh, making sure that they have the right uh, documentation. So sometimes you will find a massive gap when uh, you have a great venture that is angel backed, but then VC firms are struggling to get the, the right information and the right level of insight. Um, also, I think VC funds uh, take great comfort to see fantastic angel investors in the cap table. Uh, but I know as a VC fund, I also like to see uh, pre-seed ventures, if I'm talking ideation to pre-seed, uh, pre-seed ventures to be incubated, to be to have, uh, you know, check the box of uh, we've been selected and incubated or accelerated by uh, tech stars, seed stars, whatever uh, program you have in mind, because it shows that there has been another external validation of your business model. In theory, all those enterprise support organizations are supposed to help you put together the data room and do all the things that an angel investors don't have time, the expertise or the willingness to do. So it's really important to make sure that if you want to maximize your secondary exit, uh, moving from the angel investment to this investment, that you have uh, at least those two elements. When it comes to VCNP, uh, and not, and I don't want to take for too long, but I think yeah, everybody is aware that there is a valuation gap. I think between uh, you know VC expectations and NP expectations, and uh, very often at the VC level, um, seed for sure, and to some extent Series A, we're pressing on you know um, sales multiples. Uh, when overnight you're pressing on EBDA multiples and expecting the company to be profitable, uh, you can have a massive drop uh, in the valuation, and sometimes there is this gap that that you have to. To, to assess and, and to see how, you know, VC and P uh, funds can continue to, to work together. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Um, and also to, to bring to bring Abraham, in, Abraham into the conversation. So Abraham, obviously you have sort of researched the topic. You have spoken to a lot of people about, um, about exits and about also the challenges. Anything else that you want to add at this stage or any you know any what what do you see as the main the main challenges or maybe the main you know, necessity or why this is a relevant conversation yeah um kind of moved around a bit i was trying to catch the sun um, but it was too much <laughs> so i had to go hide somewhere where there's shade um i think Pretty much agree with everything Eric and, and Hannah have shared, and I've spoken with Hannah um, about this topic extensively. Um, but uh, I, I, just to throw in a bit of a different perspective um, from a few people as well, it so happens that there are venture investors um, that, especially in this current funding environment, that feel that uh, during the boom times, secondaries were quote unquote abused. And so they're super reticent to commit um, to investing in rounds that involve secondaries, right? Um, 
obviously it's not everybody, but there are people who invest at growth stage onwards, which is typically where you see a lot of secondary transactions. You know, that that feel that, okay, um, I'm putting in money, I'm not naming names, you know, but they are funds. I'm sure that uh, the investors in the room will probably have encountered some of them. They are your friends, you know, and they, they think, well, I'm putting in this money. It's not going to the company. I, I want to invest in the company's growth. I'm not interested in investing in uh, in giving people who are probably, quote unquote, dead equity, uh, giving them just exit because I'm just giving them money, you know, and that's a huddle. Personally, I'm curious how Hannah and Eric, how you treat those uh, conversations when you run into them, you know, but I just wanted to throw that into the mix. Sure. Um, pretty much everything they both said, something I agree with, but just to bring a different perspective. As well. No, very good. Thank you. And uh, Hannah is already, uh, please go ahead. Uh, definitely, yeah. Brian. Um, when it comes to angel investors and VC investors, we have to really understand that uh, simplifying a cap table and making sure that uh, you know the cap table is simple with a, a limited number of investors is adding value to the company, uh, both in terms of making it attractive for the next round of funding, but also in terms of governance and making sure that the people with the right uh, skill sets and the right infrastructure are adding value to to the business. Uh, now, again, going back to my change in mindset, um, obviously some funds by definition don't like to uh, invest my money so that no somebody else gets rich and I want my money to fund the growth of the company. So we don't necessarily expect to see, you know, 100% secondary transactions. However, uh, getting this consensus in Africa where, and I don't know what the right percentage should be, but where uh, 20 or 30% of the, the of the funding run should be uh, allocated to secondary opportunities that would create a very positive momentum uh, in, in the market. Uh, last but not least, uh, I'm not going to put name, I'm thinking about even uh, if I should quote the type of organization, I will be political, I won't say. Um, but uh, we were in a scenario where um, a secondary transaction was being structured. So I'm still hopeful that we'd manage to get it through uh, in the next few months. But there was one investor who, uh, De uh, decline and refuse that uh, you know the new funding round would a portion of that round would be used for secondary transactions. Whereas the three other co investors were all on board with you know we want you know these historical investors to actually exit and the valuation was right for everybody. So and and this investor yeah out of principle was like yeah I don't want my money to be used to 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 make African people rich which you know so so this change of mindset is real uh, and I think that if we share more and more of those stories maybe as a as an industry we'll get a, a better consensus there. Very good. So maybe maybe just a quick sort of explanatory question if you will. So and, uh, part of the audience are are sort of new angels. So why is it important to clean up the cap table? What does it mean and and why, where does it come into the conversation? Yeah, whoever well, feels simply, that. simply. Oh, okay, uh, oh, Eric, maybe. Please announce it. Over, yeah. but, but, but it's just uh, simply when you have to, so when you have VC funds coming at, let's say, Series A, Series B, or P for v, coming at Series C, uh, if you have to negotiate uh, with uh, 20 investors or 30 investors, including some with 1%, 2%, 3%, like you can see how this could be uh, quite, uh, you know, time consuming, not interesting, and very difficult to, to get consensus and, and to get the right corporate, corporate governance governance right and on top of that obviously the management team is uh, diluted so it's not necessarily like basically you are in a scenario where you incentivize the wrong people with the wrong tools right because if frankly you've been an angel investor sort of debt equity uh, from 3% 1% 0.5% 0, 0 for like 10 years and you know you cannot make your returns at some point you also have to to give the boon to somebody else so that you know the company can have a, a decent cap table. Uh, Eric Abraham, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I think that what you said is it's uh, very true. I think also that um, the the game is very different when you're angel than when you are VCs and the, the more you're growing. So the angel investors they look at I want to get the biggest shares because I want to get the biggest part of the money when the money comes out. That's the mindset. Uh, but bigger investors, they just say, okay, maybe I can have 1% of the company, but I will look at the term sheet and I want to have enough influence to make sure that 
the reason why I invested today will still be valid in five years, seven years, eight years. So going on that principle, the the governance becomes very, very critical for an, an investors because you can have a great companies, but if then the company goes in another direction, you know, you have some companies that are very impact driven and then after uh, you cannot influence the fact that they decide to go in another directions. Basically, you as a VC, you have an issue with your LP because you find yourself in a company where you were not supposed to invest. So I think that the, the, the way to invest is very different. And um, then it brings that the, the angel investors needs to understand what's happening after. And unfortunately, uh, we have a lot of angel investors and they they um, they they should not invest like a, a lotto ticket but this is, this is often that sometimes that i see because they okay i'm investing in that company i've seen that flutter waves gonna oh that's my lotto ticket so there is a this there is this gap in term of um of understanding the proper management of their own asset which make that not capable of understanding uh, the 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 management of the companies because not all their assets will have the same values, the value will change, and if you know that the value will change, one of the things that you're trying to do is to have certainty in terms of how the your your assets going to stay in the same trajectory, and that's uh, where comes the importance of of the um, of the cap table. The last point is the fact that all those founders they are sacrificing a lot. And what you're trying to do and what all the VCs, they understand now is that the biggest risk is that the founder just say, okay, I'm tired of it. It's too hard. I just stop. And if the, if the governance doesn't allow the founders to be incentivized and to take decisions and to be supported by the right people, it's also a way to, uh, to kill the company. And that's why uh, the restructuring of the cap table is basically... One of the first things that we looking when we're looking at a company, how we can help them to restructure that, uh, what does the right moment, um, and uh, yeah, so for me it's very very critical. Okay, so it sounds like there's many good reasons why secondaries are a good thing, why it benefits um, both the angels for it, it you know it creates liquidity it you know, it cleans up the it helps cleans up the cap tables so it's better for the VCs. um it should be better for the founder so why does it feel like we don't see that much of them why is that indeed is that the the lack of understanding is it are there other issues are there regulatory issues are there why don't we have why does it feel like we have like a thriving in uh, you know a thriving secondary, uh, you know wh why does it feel like it's not happening as much? Who wants uh, sorry, to, Hannah? Please. Sorry, just to add, like in terms of why secondaries are, are relevant. Uh, obviously, when you want a company to grow at each um, investment phase, you need to have the right stakeholders involved in the business. Mm -hmm. And while you know a seed fund or an angel investor can add a lot of value from you know ideation to like seed or seed extension rounds, when it reaches a point of Series A, you want to make sure that Series A fund who are specialized in uh, this type of assets, this type of growth, are also taking over, uh, being active board members, uh, helping the, the business continue to scale, putting in place processes and, and structures so it's really important that uh, both these funding cycle are um, both funding cycles happen but also that the, the right shareholders cycle also um, also happen as well that's the change in the shareholder structure and the type of shareholders um so going back to to, to why oh Abraham please go ahead yeah I was just going to say that uh, a minor a minor point why always throwing in the small, um, you know, minor details, why um, secondaries may be also useful for um, growth stage investors or investment firms that are coming in later in the company's uh, maturity curve is there is also, it doesn't happen every time, but there is typically also a discount factor. Um, and so if, and that's also something that could factor into a decision, you know, to, to purchase secondaries. 
from a firm. Um, say your VC fund is um, looking to improve your returns. You look at your portfolio and then you're like, okay, uh, maybe if we can get some discounts, if we're getting secondaries in that company, in a co it could be a company you're even in, currently invested in, you know, and maybe you can get some discounts, you get give some people liquidity, um, that improves your performance, um, at least at that particular point in time. Um, that could also be a tiny factor, not a very, very sure. significant, you know, um, but yeah, there are funds that also consider that as, you know, part of why you want to make that decision. It's also something that's up there as well. Just wanted to point that out as well. Yeah. No, so again, I didn't, so it feels like, like logically it all makes sense to, you know, to do secondary transactions. To me, it feels like this is still something that is, you know, it happens not not much. So is it that, for example, angels are not willing to sell? Is it that VCs are not willing to buy? Is it that they're not finding each other? Is it that the, the cost to do a transaction? Is the price not right? So what are there regulatory issues? We, why, where does it get stuck? Where do we get stuck? I think that- Hannah, please. Oh, oh sorry. Sorry, um, I, I, Hannah had the hand up, sorry, please. Uh, so, so, so they, they definitely, I don't think re regulatory issues uh, are the, the most prevalent issues when it comes to secondary transactions. Uh, but if we put a bit of uh, wine in the water or water in the wine, um, I must admit that probably VC funds or um, seed funds or and everybody uh, are not properly or sufficiently equipped and staffed to help uh, companies in terms of fundraising. And I mean, effectively, right? If you look at VC funds and how we are staffed, you know, you have typically, I mean, it depends, but you have the investment team, IR team, you have the portfolio management team, but very often the portfolio management team will focus on value-add initiatives. Um, sometimes they do help prepare with the data room, but sometimes I've noticed that in many organizations, there is a gap. And sometimes the founder will find themselves a bit alone dealing with Series A, Series B investors, and maybe there is a way for everybody in the industry to optimize these kind of uh, interactions. Um, and then I don't think the discount is the issue because at the end of the day, uh, what is a discount for someone might be a premium for somebody else, right? So even if on your book, you Yeah, I think we, Anna, it's mid frozen mid sentence. Well, uh, Eric, you wanted to comment as well? Uh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, uh, for me, I see uh, two main reasons. I mean, like from the, I've been looking at it now for for one year, and and I've seen two major reasons. The number one is uh, the maturity of the ecosystem in terms of knowledge on uh, portfolio management and uh, and management of uh, assets. Uh, when you look at uh, the angel investors, they basically, most of them don't even know the value of their portfolio. They just believe that, okay, uh, I heard that there was this round and this is the value of my portfolio. And therefore, uh, someone will say, oh, I have invested and then now my portfolio reached like a three, four million. So he says, everything is good. But then after <laughs> you start to investigate and look at the information on the company and say, oh, you know that now the company is not raising because they are in down run, they close to, they, they're gonna close. So people just quickly forget that those are papers. It's paper value versus cash value. And therefore they don't understand that there is a process beyond the fact of investing of uh, managing the paper so it, it it becomes cash, so that that is a I think that that's one of the issue and therefore I've seen several angel investors they had the opportunity to take secondaries and they did not, mm -hmm. they did not because they say uh, like one of the things that you say uh, okay uh, why am I going to take a discount if this guy is coming in it's going to be bigger but the fact that they just often forget that when the big boy comes. He changed the term sheet. When he changed the term sheet, he turned that to his advantage. And the multiple that you expect that you could have, you would have had now, you may have a better multiple going out now with a discount than in the future. But sure. unfortunately, the knowledge is not there. So they're not, they're not uh, taking it. 
the other aspect I think that why it's not happening, it was I think what uh, Anna was uh, referring to, is the fact that people think that there is no work to be done. I have assets in a company, someone wants to buy, it's easy. I come and you, you come, you want to buy? Yeah, yes, no. So when it's not like a round where you have a mix of uh, classic assessment and secondary, uh, it's basically never works because nobody wants to do the work and nobody wants to carry the financial burden of doing the work. Although I think that all parties have an interest because the, invest the angel investors wants to have more liquidity, the VC wants to have discount, but the VC doesn't have capital for it. So usually, even if he may, he may make a, a better deal, he would not have the resource to do that. So he cannot allocate money. And the angel investor says, oh, I already invest my money before. So why would I pay uh, more? If you look at more advanced ecosystem, mm -hmm. investors are managing their portfolio and trying to see what is the value of the portfolio and create cycle of exit so that they can have more liquidity and because the trend of yesterday might not be the trend, so they're trying to read the market, et cetera. That maturity, that uh, maturity is, is lacking. I had conversation with some VC firm and what they were saying is that, oh, okay, uh, you know, the founder is benefiting from it, me joining this cap table, so he should be actually financing the preparation. So there's a question in terms of who has the most value out of it. And I think that, that it, it can differ. Some angel investor can say, now I'm so long in that, I would rather pay to go out. Uh, and that and that, uh, that's actually not very uh, clear uh, in the ecosystem. The last point I would like to raise is the lack of knowledge of founders on the importance of restructuring their cap table as they're growing. Um, I have recently, I, I won't give the name, but we have organized uh, um, a second deal for a company uh, in Nigeria where we've helped the founders buy back shares from his angel investors so that he can be ready for, uh, for a, a next round because he knew that it was not possible, although the company had liquidity. So most of the, in, the, the founders, they don't know how to proceed. They don't know when it's the right moment. So because that's not in the culture, and I think that there's really a gap of knowledge in terms of the importance of this part, and that causes that um, that limited number of, of transactions that you mentioned. Okay, very good. Anna, good to have you back. We lost you there for a second. Uh, so, yeah, Eric, sorry. Uh, um, no. And so, sorry, I just want to bounce back on Eric's comments. I completely agree that nobody wants to... Uh, to carry the financial burden of uh, paying and using intermediaries who are actually uh, quite useful when it comes to uh, raising uh, following rounds of, of capital. Um, so I think that there, there is something that everybody should think of. The founders should understand that uh, uh, hiring, uh, you know, uh, companies like like Eric, Eric companies or Razors, or there are a bunch of them to make sure that uh, they manage the, the next funding round is actually quite critical. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think I think this is where maybe we, we should be able to, to optimize and to do a bit more work as an industry as well. Very good. So and some question a maybe of... DFIs. DFIs like to have facilities where they support, you know, uh, the growth of an industry. So maybe one innovative way for, for DFIs to, to use their money would say we give a grant to, to intermediaries to make sure that they structure deals as that work on the secondary side. Yeah. Uh, because I also know that uh, very often some, some investors are like we don't want to, to pay for, for the people who are actually structuring the deals. Yeah. So um, we have a couple of questions in the chat, which I'll, I'll go to in a second. Um, two other things, maybe just to, to, to think about for later. So one, the role of employees and employees with stocks and the moment that they sell. Uh, and then the other part also is about, uh, There's I think there's a, a, a the, the trend is that sort of in a, in a, in a high market, there's a lot of activity or more activity, also secondary activity, there's more people simply interested to buy. In a down market, you know, people kind of, everyone kind of freezes up, right? You don't know what's right or wrong, what's good or bad. So everything kind of, you know, but you can also argue maybe maybe it's actually a good time to uh, to buy right now because maybe uh, you can get things at a discount. Maybe there's people that are looking for, have a need for liquidity. 
um, uh, and why are there, is there anyone specializing or looking at, um, um, you know, simply, um, you know, doing much more uh, secondary, buying secondary, because there must be opportunities there. Oh, but let me just park those questions and go to the chat real quick. There's a question from uh, from Shane. I can just read it out, but you're also very welcome to open up your mic and ask the question yourself. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and read it out. But Shane, you're very welcome. I was, just, I was on go. mute. Hi. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you. A very interesting and engaging discussion. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but there was a recent um, uh, article published by Carter in the US where they commented on the secondary market and they talked about sort of the the wide range and the difference between sec the pricing of secondaries if they were ordinary shares versus uh, preference shares. And I, I, I just wonder if the panel could share the experience of this in the sort of the, the African context. Um, you know, and and whether there is any sort of kind of firm range, or whether it is, you know, it's simply sort of a, a willing buyer and a, and a and a willing seller. But I think what I'd I'd be eager to understand is, you know, whether there is a sort of a, a sort of a preference for um, ordinary shares versus preference shares. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Any any takers who wants to. So answer the question. What I can say ahead, is always yeah. depend in terms of the, the the positioning that the new investors will want to have into the organization. Um, I think that 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 plays a role into it. Uh, but to overall, that's not really a. I think that <laughs> I would like to say we're not even there. <laughs> so, I like to say just very simply. I, 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 I fully agree, Eric, with you. This was about, I was yeah, about yeah. to give the answer. We're not even there. We, we are yeah, still yeah. at the stage okay. where, you know, we need yeah. to push people to sell their shares, whether they are generally or preferred. Yeah, because it's, what's happening is that that question comes when the company is a little bit more mature. And they, and this is where the, the, those founders are really concerned about it, et cetera. But when it's very early, people, they just they just think about they just think about the opportunity of the transactions. So the educations to get at that level, it's I think that that's another that's that's another that's another I think that that's not that's not a point and very 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 far away from uh, the consideration of that I've heard. Um, then uh, so I want to say something on what you asked before. Uh, no, I, I skip it. <laughs> because otherwise, I'd be happy to share some some of our experience at Launch Africa Ventures. Uh, without being too specific in the numbers, uh, but we we do we did close some M and A uh, deals, and some of them were actually uh, public in 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 WhatsApp groups, and and these transactions went pretty smoothly. I would say most of those were still you know um, you know shared deals, so there was a, there was a very limited cash component. Uh, but when you you find the right mix, you can uh, as an investor you can have well it's not liquidity per se, but you still have like a sort of evolution in your portfolio for those women activity. Um, point number two, uh, when I look at our follow-on rounds, uh, most of them were, I would say, uh, straight sort of follow rounds, but there are a few instances where everybody agree on the table that uh, the employees at the founder should be allowed to take some cash out of the table. Because as Eric said, when we know a founder has been, uh, you know, for five years, six years, uh, living off, uh, you know, rice and pasta and uh, you reach a, a pre-series A level, of course, we would be happy for the founder to be able to take whether it's 100K, 300K, 500K uh, off the table. So I think as an industry, we are all a bit more cognizant of that because it's all a question of alignment, incentive, is in incentive and making sure that the management team still has uh, the motivation and the strength to, to go on. Um, and the last bit, uh, so I've spoken about MNA for non rounds. Um, bop, 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 bop. Uh, yes, secondary uh, exits. So we are working on a few exits. So again, I would say Africa, things are taking much longer than expected. Uh, we, we are confident that we'll have a few exits in the next, I would say, four to six months. Uh, but again, if I look at what made the process uh, a bit, uh, you know, slow, yeah, I think everybody, so then existing company, all the shareholders need to be on the same board and agree on the valuation and that it's the right moment to exit. And you have board meetings and the founder negotiating, and then with a new investor also, they have board meetings. So they, 
I feel like everybody is starting to get comfortable with exit, but the processes just mm -hmm. take a lot of time. Um, so yeah, but I think I think uh, I think confidently we'll get there more and more, and, and it's quite exciting. And then we know that uh, some Series B, C, and investors uh, have have successfully exited their their businesses to to corp uh, to large corporates. Uh, I think there was an exit yesterday for Deal, uh, like in South Africa, right? Or so so those things are happening more and more frequently. Yeah. Hopefully, uh, just want um, to add the period that yes. you, the, David you raised about the period. And say okay, is it a good period, bad period? Um, I think that uh, uh, it's very, um, it's very human nature uh, related because it's like stock market. When the stock market, when the stock is growing, everybody wants to buy, and you like that the sphere of missing out, etc. And and uh, real investors, this is the moment where they're selling. Mm -hmm. When the stock are very low. Mm -hmm. This is the moment where people are looking to fundamental and trying to acquire good companies. So, in my opinion, the current period is actually pretty good to do secondaries because mm -hmm. the moment where you will have proper fundamental discussions with the founder on his companies, this is the moment where you will see resilience and where you say that, okay, uh, it's worth to do the secondaries because no need to do a second reason in a moment where the market is flooded with money because you just say that even if the company is not performing, there's money on the market. But the thing is that venture capital is like a five, seven years, 10 years, you know, so things, a lot of things can happen. So I think that the current period is the right period for uh, secondaries, in my opinion. Very good, very good. Anna, and agreeing with Eric, I think that if the VC industry in Africa is trying to take lessons from what happened in the, in the P industry, uh, if you talk to P investors on the content for the past 10 years, they will always tell you uh, the mistake number one that we made. Uh, was not to take the money and good money on day one and thinking that, uh, you know, in, th in three months time, there would be excellent money uh, on the table. So having a good return today in Africa is always better to, than have it, tra trying to have an excellent return in three months time because of volatility, international trends and stuff like that. Uh, so definitely something to bear in mind. And I think as a VC fund, the, the point is around uh, and we've established a strategy. What is the minimum returns that we expect for certain type of holdings uh, and as soon as we have these minimum returns which can be just giving a random example but uh, four times and 45 percent IRR then you have the right uh, you know window to actually uh, you know uh, dispose of the position and obviously there are also your top winners uh, so for us whether it's a top 10 or top 20 companies where we feel like these are unicorns that we hold you know until until the end but for the rest we are very much uh, pr pragmatic and proactive in terms of, of management. Um, very good, very good. Um, we, we have some more questions. Uh, right. Thanks, Anna. We have some more questions from the audience. I have uh, uh, James, if you want to, if you don't mind, uh, um, open up your mic and, and ask me a question. Yes, hello, uh, David. Hello, Hannah, again. Um, uh, I was just um, saying, although I understand Hannah's point about cleaning up the cap table, uh, due to the lack of access to funding, many of our membership of African female founders uh, will have bootstrapped along with a larger number of friends and family angels uh, than perhaps male firms uh, may have. Uh, from what I'm hearing, that uh, this could once again handicap women founders if the industry prefers a cleaner and leaner set of shareholders. Mm. So from my side, I need to prepare um, uh, our, our women for that kind of conversation. Uh, and then in addition, does the recent increased use of safes for friend and, friends and family angels add or, ditch or, or detract for, for VCs? Thank you. No, very good point, a very good question. Um, thank you very much for, for raising the point because I think it's a topic that I had not explicitly uh, thought uh, even as a as a sort of uh, general lens investor, and it's a good point that uh, cap table for female founders tend to be a bit more fragmented, include less prominent angel investors, uh, less prominent acceleration programs, and definitely this could be an impediment in their ability to, to raise capital. Uh, so thank you very much for making the point, and I think as an investor, we also need to, to take this type of uh, structural issues into account when we are assessing those opportunities and make sure we are not uh, discriminating them. Um, 
now uh, on your second point, uh, I think safe uh, safe agreements are still the main tool that is used in the industry, at least at the you know from the ideation to the precede uh, level. It's uh, fully uh, fully um, you know used. I think if I look at our portfolio at Launch Africa Ventures. Probably seventy to eighty percent of our seed transactions are through safe, uh, but I must admit that we are seeing an increase uh, in the use of equity, especially in our strategy when we look at early stage pre-seed company. We want to make sure that we go through directly through equity because we have a very strong, uh, you know, conviction uh, on the on the company, and because it's so early, valuation might be tricky even through a safe because typically in your safe agreement you still want to put like a sort of valuation cap. Uh, so. Equity, I think, is a bit on the rise, especially uh, early stage. And I think also convertible notes uh, are an instrument that more and more VC funds are comfortable using. And the last few deals that have closed, uh, we used uh, convertible notes also quite uh, quite substantially as well. Uh, and I actually even spoke to two VC funds who were telling me that they don't want to use safe agreements because they feel that uh, the uncertainty on what the actual cap table will be after conversion of all the safe agreement is too high, that a lot of people do not actually understand the mechanism of uh, you know conversion of the safe agreement and that they've seen scenarios. So those two funds have been operating, let's say, for more than five years. And they've seen scenarios where founders were highly disappointed because they did not realize that uh, safe after safe after safe after safe, once they had a price round, they were materially diluted. Um, so yes, to say, but please bear in mind that VC funds are more and more open to equity, uh, convertible, and even like uh, venture debt, right? So, so you need to think about all these financial tools when it comes to funding the business. Uh, and uh, just to, to add on the please. challenge for the, the woman, I think that uh, it's important for the, the in the case that was mentioned to understand that the small angel investors they mostly have all the same interests and that I think that this there's something that they often ignore is that um, they can organize themselves structure themselves uh, in order to to I mean to have a aggregate voice and and that and simplify it so. Uh, and often they forget because everybody think about his own backyard and that this is what create that uh, that complexities. But uh, today with the different instruments that are available, if all the minority investors can organize themselves because they have a, 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 an alignment, you can either put a government into the into the into the into the company or among the investors. And I know that in some of the company that we we support, We've helped them to implement that governance among the investors, and we structure it in a way that uh, they can actually have a better conversation with larger investors. So, I think that there's not uh, there's always a solutions uh, from when when you can actually put everything on the table with different stakeholders involved. Okay, lovely. So Thank we, you very much. Thanks, thanks, James. Thanks for joining us. So, so we have about uh, we only have about five minutes left in in the conversation. Time flies. So I want to try and sort of take us um, towards in the in in the, in, the, in the world of solutions. So maybe if we think like you know five years from now, what what do you hope the world looks like? What 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 is in place? What is functioning to make sure that you know that 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 we have sort of we have taken this one level up? I mean, Abraham, maybe to start with you. Five years from now, what is what is working well? What is what is happening? What have we what have we fixed? What is what's going better? Uh, well, I think one of the things that comes that becomes better. I was surprised that actually it wasn't mentioned. Um, we have more uh, African VCs, African growth stage VCs that have the capital to deploy. Um, so that it makes it easier when you have these conversations about, okay, we need to clean up a cap table, right? One of the things you, you had asked about why we're not seeing so many secondaries, right? Especially now. And I think one of the very obvious answers is that a lot of the investors from outside of Africa have left the continent. They're not putting in money. They're not looking at deals, um, at least at the pace as they were looking at it before. And when you have that uh, that situation, you're going to you just have limited capital you know looking for 
you have how many African companies, think about it, you know, are, are trying to raise a Series A um, onwards right now. Several of them, I know a few of them, right? Um, but they don't have as much of a pool of investors that they are talking to sure. daily. Um, and I think this has to do with some of the work, um, David, you've been doing with the Boost Africa facility. You know, we have some of those investors that can come in at those more mature stages of the company. Um, because that the point Eric made earlier about the ecosystem or um, being more mature is actually very strong. It cuts across the different aspects of this conversation, right? So the more you have VCs um, that are looking at more mature companies, I have a few of them and we're thankful. Several more are raising more larger funds to invest in those companies, right? And two, three, four years from now, I expect that uh, we have a bit more of those companies that are trying to have these conversations, right? Eric has talked about how maybe this is the perfect time to start purchasing secondaries. Um, <laughs> well, hopefully we, we, we still have uh, well, I don't know if it's even hopeful that we still have a situation like this in the next two, three years when we have maybe more firepower, more people that are looking at deals um, so that people like uh, Hannah wouldn't have to go all the way to seed stage just to get deals um, because you have so much of a, a pipeline of growth stage deals and it keeps you too occupied to even look further down the line. I think that's okay. something that really, really improve um the situation and make uh, some angels smile. Sure. More capital, more local capital, more maturity. Hanna, Eric, other? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, so definitely, hopefully in five years' time, uh, it will be mainstream in the industry that at any funding rounds, up to, I'm just giving random numbers, but up to 30% of the capital from the new funding round should be used for secondary opportunities, both for the employees and the angel investors and the previous VC fund so that everybody can have a win-win partnership. Uh, I think the second wish would be uh, for intermediaries and advisory boutiques to be able to find the right business model for them and to find people who are ready to pay for their services when they structure deals at every single funding round. Uh, and or another solution would be also for VC funds to ensure that they incorporate and for investment clubs as well to incorporate this uh, intermediary function within the team and that it becomes mainstream that the same way you have an investment team, investor relations, portfolio management team, you have an advisory team with just focus on structuring secondary opportunities in your portfolio. And last but not least, because I always like uh, to be creative in my uh, investments, I hope we'll see more uh, innovative uh, structuring on secondary. So for instance, while well, this is happening today for us, but we are in talk with uh, international uh, corporates who say, actually, we are interested potentially in buying all your top uh, fintech ventures in your portfolio. So just put together a package of three or four ventures that fit this type of criteria, turnover, geographical exposure, and we're happy to, to buy that out from you. Uh, or what we see is like uh, potential uh, some secondary houses uh, from the US who are like actually would like to have a 10 million or 20 million dollar exposure to your fund. Uh, so we're happy to buy out uh, you know all your LPs um, prorata up to you know a value of 10 or 20 million dollars. So there are a lot of structuring tools that we can use when it comes to secondaries to make it worthwhile for everybody. So hopefully in five years' time, all those tools will be uh, mainstream and uh, we we'll see uh, more opportunities um, and value created on the continent. Uh, very good, very good. Um, look at the time, Eric. Last word is for you. Uh, thank you. So I, I would say that I, I see two two key elements. Number one is that the same way we had the value of debt for the startup, I think now we are now entering into value of debt for the for the, the, the investment ecosystem, which means that uh, in five years down the line, what we hope is that we find our balance and the African model uh, for venture capital. Uh, for sustainability of venture capital. Which brings me to my second point is the fact that at the moment, a lot of the capital coming to the, 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 the continent is actually supported by development, uh, you know, partners, which is uh, where their, and their objectives is actually to create a, a you know, like a, a starting platform for a market to move, but not to sustainably, sustainably continue to do that, to that process. And I think that the transition that I see before we see whatever large 
uh, international fund to come into Africa is that there's an aspect that I think that we need to get into is the interconnection between large African corporate and African startups. Because I mean, like it's a little bit like what uh, Anna mentioned in terms of the international corporate looking at opportunities in Africa. Uh, but I think that today, uh, a lot of the corporate are controlling the largest market, which is the SMEs market with, with flood with capital and with under uh, equipped in terms of technology. And in the same time, we have a full ecosystem of a tech startup or developing solution that usually are not integrated into that space. And I think that the transition that I hope that will happen in the five years is that the large co there will be a possibility to show how large corporate can start integrate uh, the actors in the integration of the tech startup into the value chain, which will create more liquidity for that ecosystems. And that will create also more opportunity of exit. So I think that that, that combination of trans, uh, transitions between the going out of the, the value of debt for the investments and um, the African large corporate integration and of into the innovation ecosystems, that will, if we have this combination that I see very positively the next five years, but that's just a if. Very good, okay. Um, so it feels like uh, it feels like there's much more to speak about, much to talk about. Uh, but we have to uh, look at the time. We have to sort of uh, yeah, we have to sort of wrap up the uh, the panel. Um, so on behalf of, of of the team, and I trust all the participants. Thanks, uh, Hannah. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Abraham, for uh, for joining us today and for sharing your wisdom. Uh, I hope you'll you continue to join us and uh, yeah, and 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 speak with uh, with uh, with the alumni and and, and the greater sort of. Uh, uh, angel and and the research investor community. Um, so this wraps up the panel, but we're not done yet with the with the full Angel Connect session. Um, John, if you could sort of take us back to the slide deck, then I want to invite my colleague extraordinaire Alexander Fraser to speak a little bit about our plans for the future and very specifically the current cohort we're recruiting for, which of course is cohort ten. Um, Alex, are you with us? I am. Very good. Very um, good. So over to you, Alex. First of all, a huge thank you to our speakers. Um, I think that uh, it was a really lively discussion, and I always love it when people add on to everyone else and uh, the lots of comments flowing, uh, lots of uh, comments in the chat as well. Um, and I think we probably could have had a half day workshop on this. Um, really kind of getting into it. So big thank you to our speakers and David to you as always for moderating. Um, really excitingly, we are kicking off recruitment um, in conjunction with ABAN and thanks to our wonderful partners at the Dutch Good Growth Fund, we are running the next African Angel Academy cohort, cohort 10, and we are doing a woman um, exclusive uh, platform. Um, and we are currently accepting applications. So if you're keen on applying to African Angel Academy, please do so. Um, we have already got um, a number of applications and we're accepting people on a rolling basis. So please don't wait till the last minute. Applications um, are closing at the beginning of next month. Uh, we also have a information session coming up this time next week. Um, and Jess has just posted uh, the link to the applications in the chat, as well as the sign up um, link to the information session. So those of you who don't know about the African Angel Academy, it is a online course with uh, 12 online video modules, uh, but each week we connect with one another in a format very similar to this. We hear from uh, expert angels, uh, learn from best practice, uh, give you access to resources, guides, and templates, and we have... Um... <coughs> Excuse me. We have great speakers every week, just like Hannah, Eric, and Abraham today. Uh, join us on the African Angel um, Academy. We either alternate between a Q&A session or a masterclass, ending with a startup showcase. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Um, but it's really a fantastic opportunity. And um, when when we meet each other in person, they're just big smiles and hugs. And um, it really has built an amazing network across the continent. Um, we had we had a meetup last week in Nairobi, which I was um, which I was very fortunate to be at, and we had people saying, "Please take a photograph of we're all cohort six, we all cohort eight. and it was it was really fun. And then the week before that, we were in Tanzania um, with uh, Masechu, who's on this call, and Martin with his angels uh, also. Uh, connecting so it's so great that we can see each other more and more um if you wondering wondering whether you are the type of angel that we would uh, look for on our program uh, this is just to give you a little bit more of an overview of who we're looking for we're looking generally our angels are professional mid to late career and when we say professional they come from a number of different sources so we're seeing either entrepreneurs who've been successful and wanting to invest into the next generation. We see a lot of uh, professional service providers like lawyers and accountants who work with um, work with uh, startups and are wanting to invest in them. We also see uh, angels who are in the world of finance but might play a bit later stage. Um, so for instance, Hannah is a perfect example of that. Uh, working for a PE and now a VC fund, but also playing in the angel space um, or have mentored and, and, and worked with startups very closely. But the one thing that unites them is that they're passionate about uh, investing in African startups. They're wanting a return on investment, but some also find that impact is important, whether that's a gender lens or whether that's a specific sector um, or whether that's just through job creation and economic growth. Um, most of our angels also invest through syndicates or, gro or groups. So we also, through the African Angel Academy, you get to meet like-minded angels, people who have similar views to you and similar investment mandates. Um, and typically our angels invest between $1,000 to $50,000 per deal. And we really encourage angels to kind of build out an angel investment strategy and a portfolio, which is much easier if you do this through investing in groups. So uh, next steps, uh, scan to sign up uh, for the information session. If you've got any inf uh, questions, you are very welcome to ask those uh, next week at the info session, um, but you can always reach out to us on um, email as well. Uh, the cost for commitment is $230. And it is 90% uh, sponsored by our sponsors, which is which is really fantastic. And um, yeah, we really look forward to uh, receiving your applications and hopefully seeing many of you in the next cohort, cohort 10. But happy to stay on the line and answer any questions if anyone um, wants to join. I have been asked, what about men? Will they still be able to participate? And we do have an option uh, for anyone who wants to join. You can go on to the African Angel Academy and sign up for a self-paced course and uh, happily uh, include you in the community. Um, but this cohort and sponsored places are specifically for women. Very good. Thank you so much, uh, Alex. Um, and that brings us to the end of, uh, of uh, this season's Angel Connect. So again, uh, a big thanks to our speakers. Also, of course, a big thanks to uh, the team that makes everything possible. John, Jessica, Sky, Claire, who left a little bit earlier, and of course, Steve and Alexandra. Um, so if there's no further last-minute questions or comments, then... Thank you again for joining. I hope you found it interesting. Uh, let's stay in touch via uh, our platform, via social media, um, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Enjoy your evening. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for joining. Thanks, Eric. Speak soon. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Abraham. Enjoy Kigali. Hope to see you soon. Thanks, everyone.